I would like to request Dr. Avinash Kumbhar from the Department of Chemistry, Savitri Bai Phule, Pune University, to kindly give an introduction uh, of the activities of the Science Club. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of uh, the Science Club, uh, Savitri Bai Phule, Pune University. As you are aware, we uh, have lectures by eminent uh, scientists. Uh, this is the fourth lecture in the series this semester, and. The, the first lecture was by Professor uh, Raghavendra Gadakkar, uh, former INSA president from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And he delivered a talk on uh, experiments, uh, how to design experiments to study insect behavior. The second one was by Professor Dani from TIFR uh, Mumbai on Euclidean mathematics. And the third one was by uh, Professor Rohini Godbole from uh, Indian Institute of Science, uh, Bangalore. And the topic was heart of matter, where she spoke on particles in, in physics, particle physics. And today, we have a, a very eminent speaker, Professor Valiathan, who is an expert on matter inside the heart. He's going to deliver his talk uh, later on. And uh, incidentally, today is also the 129th birth anniversary of Dr. Maulana Azad, and it is also being celebrated as the National Education Day. And I'm sure you will all agree with me that this is a very befitting person we have over here who's going to deliver the colloquium, Professor Valiathan, who is also going to talk to us about traditional and modern science. Thank you. And now I welcome Professor. S.R. Gadre to uh, say a few words, and give his remarks. Oh, thank you, Avinash. I'm supposed to be an official mentor of this program, so I'm standing here uh, for a minute just to tell you a little bit about the idea of this science colloquia. Often we get lost in the specialization that we are undergoing. The world is becoming very specialized. A chemist will not like to listen to biologists. A biologist will hate mathematics and so on. So the idea of the science colloquium is to bring together all sciences in such a way that there is a technical content uh, in the talks, but it is presented at a semi-popular level. I mean, uh, when we conceived the idea, I had the philosophy of scientific American in mind. I hope our students read scientific American because it is brought up in a very great way. The, the magazine runs for, is running for several decades now. So that is the idea and uh, accordingly if you look back uh, to the talks that we had so far in the program, they had various things, mathematics, biology, biotechnology, now we will we'll have today medical and health sciences uh, mixture in the talk. I have known Professor Valiathan in many capacities in the last decades. <laughs> he was the president of INSA when I was a member of the INSA council for a few years. And uh, uh, you know, uh, formal introduction will be there. But I would like to add that in these colloquia, we look for scholarship not only impact factors and publications and so on, but we look for scholarship, and he is a role model of scholarship uh, in India. Okay. Uh, just one very earthly announcement. We are giving some prizes for the best summary of the talk. All, it's open only to students, not to faculty. Okay, so, so uh, all the students here, when you go through the talk, Make a short summary, 200 words is the limit, submit it and it will be evaluated and a small token prize will be given to the best uh, summary that we receive, best summaries that we receive. I mean, we won't be stingy, there won't be just one prize, several prizes will be there. So please take out your pens, keep your CPUs active and, <laughs> and write down the summary. So with that, uh, let me hand over to Avinash for 
as the science club activity is usually coordinated by students it felt apt to invite a student to introduce such a personality hence i request mr akash sagam a phd student from ccih to give a brief introduction about dr ms valiathan's exemplary contributions to scientific research thank you kalyani uh, hello everyone and uh, good afternoon on behalf of uh, center for complementary and integrative health and science club of Sa savitribai phule pune university uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, dr professor uh, ms valiathan padma vibhushan professor martand varma shankaran valiathan graduated in medicine from the kerala university and received training in surgery in the uk with subsequent specialization in cardiac surgery in the us he became a fellow of the royal college of surgeons of england in 1960 and a, a master of surgery from the university of liverpool 2 years later he received the fellowship of the canadian royal college in cardiac surgery in 1970 professor valiathan's professional and scientific interests were cardiac surgery in children studies on the causation of a tropical heart muscle disease and the development of technology for ca cardiovascular vascular devices he has published a monograph and many scientific papers on this subjects for over a decade dr valiathan has taken up a serious study of ayurveda and published five books including the redaction of the ancient texts of charaka susruta and vagbhata his interest in supporting research in modern biology based on the cues from ayurveda has led to the creation of a task task force in ayurvedic biology in department of science and technology uh, under his chairmanship he is a recipient of the fellowship of the national academies of medicine science and engineering in india many honorary doctorates and several international honors including the hunterian professorship of the royal college of surgeons of england chevalier in the in the order of palms academics of french government and dr samuel asper award for international medicine medical education johns hopkins university in the us he received the padma vibhushan from the government of india in 2005 with this i request dr valiathan to uh, commence his lecture please professor gadre dr bhushan patwarthan dr rama vaidya other distinguished guests and my friends it's a great a pleasure and a privilege for me to be asked to speak here the science club and i must express my appreciation to the center for complementary and integrative health the science club and the pune university for the honor they have done me the subject i have chosen is uh, ayurveda and modern science as you heard i am not professionally an ayurvedic physician some 30 years i was uh, practicing cardiac surgeon i started learning ayurveda when i was past 65 so this is the first 7 or 8 years studying the three basic texts of ayurveda prahatrai writing books i enjoyed doing that but as i did that study and writing it occurred to me that there are several areas in ayurveda which could be subjected to investigation using modern science i found that the ayurvedic research in the 20th century mostly it has been largely through pharmacology medicinal chemistry herbal drugs developing molecular drugs from herbal preparations and so on this is a very large area still very active started by ramnath chopra incidentally first part of 20th century but there is something else which has happened towards the end of the 20th century that is where 
molecular biology has come, a new modern biology has come. Now I found that there are opportunities, modern science could be harnessed to study some ancient ideas, ancient procedures. That looked like a very attractive proposition to me and I've been uh, busy with that in the last few years. So what I say will be largely about this in the context of uh, the interaction between science and Ayurveda. I'd begin by uh, saying that the interaction started long ago. The, it is part of the East-West encounter. India has seen no had contact with a number of other uh, countries, conquerors coming here. Many of them came for conquests. Many came for plunder. Very few came in search of knowledge to India. This is how it started. Now, the, the results were different. For example, in the area of music, there was not much of uh, effect of the West on Indian music or Indian dances relatively immune. But in the area of judiciary, we have completely a western judicial system. Our criminal procedure code, we are still following all over. There is not much of protest, willingly accepted. English language, for example. Science and technology, everywhere. Pune University. These are irreversible changes. But in the area of medicine, that is also interesting. Western medicine, when it came to India, largely in the 19th century, practice of medicine. They tried in Calcutta, initial native medical schools they started, because they could not get enough British doctors. So the first year was a common curriculum taken from Western medicine of those days. And then the next two years, the Muslim students would be learning Avicenna and texts. Hindu students were taught Charaga and Sushra. This was done by East India Company. But there was, I have seen the textbooks actually written. Hare Krishna Singh in Chandigarh, he has copies of these. But there was wide protests from Ram Mohan Rai and many others. The Renaissance in, Kal in Bengal. They wanted this abolished. There should be one medical course. So William Bentick ordered and that is how the modern medical school came. So the interaction has been going on for a long time. I just wanted to take more looking at not the practice of science, medicine, I am looking at the science interaction. Now here the, from, actually it started from the 16th century, the interaction between western science and modern medicine. Now this started with a remarkable man called Garcia de Orta in the 16th century. Uh, he was a Portuguese physician who graduated in medicine from Spain and he was looking for an opportunity. He was not a rich man and a friend of his was traveling as the head of the fleet coming to India. So he joined him and the 36 years he practiced in Goa from 1534 and he was the first European to write a book on the India's medicinal plants. And he was the first to mention Ravolfia Serpentina, which is not mentioned in our Brihatrai. And he was the first to describe cholera, which was new to him. Ayurveda, we have Altisara, Vishuchika, but there is no dramatic description as an epidemic, which we are familiar with. That's not the way it is described. Here is a classic description what cholera was. 100,000 people dying in a month in Calcutta, that kind of dramatic descriptions. And you see the first description uh, from Garcia. And this classic colloquies on the simples and drugs of India, which was published in 1563, and 57 colloquies. In those days, it was the style was, popular style was two people having a dialogue. It was presented in that form to make it more intelligible, more attractive. And in this, the dialogue is between Garcia himself and a colleague of his called Ruano. These are the two people taking part in these dialogues and they refer to plants largely, the habitat of plants, morphology, use, use in treatment, commercial aspects even are discussed. And descriptions were given vividly, especially cholera, 
dysentery, diseases which were strange to him, he described in great detail. And he also describes Sarpagandha, Ravulfia, all the co co cobra, that is the term. But when he describes this, he recommends the use for fever, rheumatism, smallpox, measles and cholera. But this uh, Paudi called cobra in, in North India, it was used for mental disorders. There is no mention of mental disorders in Garcia's list. The Portuguese physicians and uh, others who were resident in uh, colonies in Sri Lanka, in India, Macau, etc., they did not pay much attention to Garcia's book. But it received immediate attention in Europe, widely popular, it was translated into French, Italian, other languages, and English translation came very late. And in this dialogue, Garcia appears as a liberal person. That is, Greek medicine is the basic medicine, but he is willing to accept something which is seen to be effective in other systems of medicine, Arab or Asian. But Ruano, the other, his colleague, he is a conservationist. He would not accept anything except Greek medicine. That is how the dialogue is presented. And in this you will find many Ayurvedic medicinal plants which you see in Gabrahtari he is using. But there are also many plants which are not mentioned like uh, Ravolfia because the native physicians in Goa, they had a lot of folk practice of medicine. They were using those. They are also mentioned. The next comes the 17th century. That is a Dutch governor of uh, Cochin, Van Reed. He was not a physician, he was an, a, a brilliant naval commander. And when he settled in uh, Kochi as the governor, he found some. Yesterday I was telling Dr. Gadri about this. this. He noticed that people living in Kerala, especially in the Cochin area, he did not think much about their food. It, he thought it was a very low nutritious, unattractive food. But he was puzzled that these people were healthy. They were working very hard, physical labor, climbing trees and so on all day, and they were remarkably healthy. How can with this kind of wretched food, these people can be healthy? This was a puzzle. And then he noticed that uh, in their diet, every day they would be taking coriander or dried ginger, cloves, pep uh, pepper, turmeric. So there is no food where there is not some small part of the spices and they take it all their lives. So he started wondering maybe this is what is make, give, giving them this health. So he wanted to study spices all along the Malabar coast because he was a governor he could command your, virtually an army of 100 people, herbalists, native doctors, professors of botany, artists who could draw these. So he had a very large number of people and he wanted to have a physician who could tell them about this particular plant, what is it used for. Now, no physician was available and most of the Ayurvedic physicians were high caste people. They would not cooperate with a westerner in a study. So, Garcia, this uh, Van Reed approached the Maharaja of Kochi, he was the governor, so he could tell the Kochi king, I need some help. So he designated a physician called Itti Achutan from the Idava community. They were considered OBCs in those days. But they had plenty of high Sanskrit scholars and physicians. He was the one who gave all the help. This particular plant, it is used for this particular disease. Now that is in, the, in this book, the acknowledgments in the beginning, you can see E.T. Achizan, they have all agreed. So, authorship, it is all taken care of in this book. It is a remarkable book, uh, published Hortus Malabaricus, the Garden of Malabar. 30 years of this study, funded by the Dutch East India Company, also supported by the Maharaja of Cochin and the Zamorin of Calicut. So, it is a classic publication in Latin, and it was uh, a real, even today it is a, a treasure to see that. And 740 plants from Kerala, all along from Kanyakumari to Goa, 
and the ethnobotanical information given by all these people, verification of plant names done by three people who actually belong to where I live now. I live in Manipal, South Canada. All these three people, Ranga Bhatt, Apu Bhatt and Vinayak Pandit, all these three people, the plants which are mentioned here, find their place in the Ayurvedic Nikhandus and give the reference. These were the people. And uh, so this was translated uh, into English and Malayalam only in 1980s by Professor Manilal. This is just a sample of the illustration. Very high quality, uh, black and white. These are classic uh, pictures. You simply cannot improve them. The original plates for these, there are the engravers. He got the engraving done. They are all in British Museum, all the 740. Now the, these two, essentially they are working on taxonomy, 16th century and 17th century. Now that created very great interest in the taxonomy in the European countries and Portuguese, Netherlands, France, all these, they were colonial powers. They were trying to come to Asia, particularly India, which was known as a land of great wealth. They wanted to come here mainly for plunder and conquest. That is what they were coming for. But they were scared of tropical diseases. They had heard all these rumors about cholera and so on, thousands of people dying. They didn't have means of treating them. They didn't know how to treat them. So there was great interest in these colonialists about tropical diseases, how they treated. That was the main reason for their interest. And they also knew that there is a market in this. Even at that time, if you could make drugs out of it and sell it, they could make a profit. So that also was there. And Linnaeus, the father of uh, taxonomy, he has actually praised, he says, I wish this, I had seen this earlier. It was such a great classic, Hortus Malabaricus. But these two, the Botanical Survey of India, was the British took interest in this. Out of those, the following these, the 200 years after the Van Reed, among the great people who took interest in taxonomy, one was Roxborough, particularly memorable. He was in Bengal. He wrote a book, Hortus Bengalensis. He never became as famous as uh, Hortus Malabaricus. But he was a person, such a great scientist, a physician who became a botanist. And he was revered by J.C. Bose. In fact, he used to consider his uh, residence as a place of pilgrimage. He was a really, truly a great scientist, Roxborough. And all over, in, uh, even in Madras, there is one Sharif who wrote a book on Indian taxonomy. Many Ainsley in Chennai again. Now, in the 19th century, because of the interest is so great, 70% of the drugs of plant origin in the British pharmacopoeia they were all of Indian origin. And the botanical survey, the British by that time they had established in India, they set up among the surveys, zoological survey, geological survey. One very important survey was botanical survey of India, which gave further impetus to studies in medicinal plants. Now, so all the first view, science taking on Ayurveda was all through the window of uh, taxonomy. Now in 20th century, something new happened. That was Ramnath Chopra. He was appointed the, the School of Tropical Medicine, Calcutta, which was one of the institutions established by the British. They not only established hospitals, it is not often remembered that they established a number of scientific institutions. School of Tropical Medicine is one of them. Kasauli Institute is another, King Institute, Gindi, Hafkin Institute, Bombay. So there are about 10, 12 institutions they established, all only for scientific research. There is a certain amount of applied. If you look at that, it's surprising. They were also, uh, one, they were of course making vaccines for all the local use. They were produced, something of practical use. At the same time, they were also in charge of, uh, in charge of investigating local outbreaks of diseases. They were in charge of that. If there was an outbreak of a diarrhea or a viral fever or something, this institute had to go and get samples from there and investigate. So it's very carefully planned. Uh, government gave funding for this. So this is one of those <coughs> institutes in Calcutta. It's a remarkable work. We, that's not our subject today. But Ramnath Chopra, when he appointed there, he started a totally new activity, pharmacology. He is actually revered as the father of Indian pharmacology. And uh, he did monumental work in his own. I have taken two paragraphs from his book, 
his objective in starting this to make Indian pharmacology self-supporting by enabling her to utilize locally produced drugs economically under standard laboratory conditions and to discover remedies from the claims of Ayurvedic TB and other indigenous sources suitable to be employed by the exponents of Western medicine. This is Sir Ramnath Chopra's and his work involved botanical identification, chemical analysis, pharmacologic studies and clinical trials of a large number of commonly used drugs. And it goes on, extensive studies on the physiologic action of the active components on living tissues in the water bath, nerve muscle preparations and so on, trying the effect biochemical and biophysical changes brought about by on mammalian organisms, carried out pioneering studies on Rawolfia and his books The Indigenous Drugs of India and Medicinal and Poisonous Plants of India in two volumes, they became classics and he is acknowledged as the father of uh, Indian pharmacology. Now this was, it was natural that organic chemistry, natural products chemistry that came in the wake of uh, Ramna Chopra studies. A large volume of work has been done by brilliant scientists. I can only mention a few, Asuna Chatterjee, Govinda Chari, uh, Sukhadev and many, many others. And uh, these are classic studies, there is no point reading all this like name work of Govinda Chari. These are all very well known for this audience. I can tell you a few years ago, I happened to be in Paris, there was an Indo-French council and the French pharmaceutical industry once called us for an evening with them. So I asked them, what is the focus of your, major focus of your R&D today in France, in drugs? Oh, immediately that uh, chairman said, oh, I can tell you easily, that is aging. Aging is our problem. So we work on that. Then he volunteered, he said, I can tell you, we are actually working on a, a lead given by one of your scientists. So I was surprised. I said, uh, who is that? This is Asima Chatterjee because the work that they had done, it is a huge database. The whole world is using that. That we must remember, it's a great work. Now 21st century, where we are now, the discovery of the double helix, that changed the, the entire picture. The way we look at uh, organs, we look at human body, we look at health and disease, everything has been influenced by double helix. Now. There was a time when, say for example, we were medical students, we looked at organs, organ specialization, whether it is kidney or the heart or the liver. Even before that, it was a whole human being. Then it came to organs. Then it came to cell, nucleus, DNA. It became more and more reductionist. Now this is very true because very recently, we were doing some work on a rasayana on the heart this organ, does it have any effect on the heart? Because Amalaki Rasayana has effect on the whole body. So we were looking at various organs. This whole body, so naturally it should have an effect on the brain, on the heart. So that paper, when you did the initial work, it took, a, it is done in the rat. And we could show very clearly that cardiac hypertrophy, I will mention that again later, it has a beneficial effect. There is a beneficial effect on ejection fraction, how much blood the left ventricle is pumping. All these we had shown, effort tolerance improves. Now this, a top journal won't accept it. All very good evidence, echocardiography is done, ejection fraction is calculated, it's all there. No, no, it can't be accepted. But we were determined, we should publish in that journal. So what is necessary is the mitochondria, the energetics. What is, how does, that is the mechanism for this, the hypertrophy. How does it, how do you explain it in terms of this mitochondrial energetics? That is the, so we did that. It took another two years, four years. Ultimately, it was published in Nature Reports. So we, this is what is to be accepted as science. Unless it is carried to the DNA level, it is no longer accepted as science, which is a pity, but that is where it is. So Ayurveda naturally, taxonomy, pharmacology, then we finally come to molecular biology. So this is a new perspective of Ayurveda.
Ayurveda remains the same, but we look at it through different windows. Now this is Ayurveda and science, they are not strangers, because P. C. Ray, many of you will know, he was the founder of modern chemistry in India, a very great man in Calcutta at that time, when the West and East, they encounter. Now, he was a saint. As a bachelor, he lived in a single room in Presidency College. He wrote the history of chemistry in India, which is a classic. Without even going to Britain, the university there gave him a doctorate for his book, a classic book. I hope your library has it, you should read it. Now, P. C. Ray, 600 B.C. to 800 A.D. in that book, he calls it the Ayurvedic period in the history of Indian science. He calls it that because Ayurveda is not only the mother of medicine, it is also the mother of chemistry. Because according to P. C. Ray, the whole book is mostly about that mercury, Rasatantra, that rasa is mercury. Now that, he has of course covered that very extensively in that. But he has even classics in Rasa Shastra he has translated. To that extent he has gone. So that chemistry is the foundation of uh, Indian, chemi Indian chemistry. And that he has traced it uh, through. And Ayurveda, as you know very well, that is an integral part of uh, Ayurveda. Uh, so he says that it is the mother of chemistry. But we could also add it is the mother of uh, Indian uh, botany. We have so many veterinary science because we have uh, Ayurveda for plants, Ayurveda for elephants, Ayurveda for horses. There are big texts for these. So veterinary science also this is the mother. So it is the mother of all these uh, biomedical sciences. That, so therefore to do science in Ayurveda it is not uh, surprising because they are very close to each other. And the, what we are trying to do using this uh, molecular approach is the biological basis of Ayurvedic concepts and procedures and the mechanistic basis of therapeutic effects. Suppose somebody has got arthritis, you give an Ayurvedic medication and you find the swelling reduces, redness reduces, pain reduces. Now what is the mechanism of this? What is the mechanism of action? Now that is also coming in this. You need this molecular approach to study those changes. Immunologic changes happening in the body. These are all modern biology. And uh, this did not receive any attention in the 20th century, partly because we were obsessed with the taxonomy, medicinal plants and drugs. And secondly, the modern tools didn't exist. In the 1950s, we didn't, have, we didn't know much about the DNA, gene sequencing, gene expression, we didn't know any of these things. There were no tools to study them. Immunology simply did not exist. In the pathology text which I learned in the medical college, inflammation is the first thing that we learn in pathology. So in the center of the very epi epicenter where the necrosis is taking place. But as you go more and more peripherally, you will find various types of cells, neutrophils, different types of cells. And at the very periphery, you will see big collections of lymphocytes. In the boy's textbook, he writes, the real soldiers fighting, these are the, leukoc the le leukocytes. They are there, right there, dying in large numbers. But in the periphery, these are the phlegmatic spectators. This is what he writes about lymphocytes. Today, we realize they are anything but phlegmatic. The whole cell is full of nucleus. There is tremendous activity. We didn't know that. So immunology didn't exist at that time. So today we have all that. So we can study. There is a new opportunity for us. So Ayurvedic biology essentially, it is biology, but they take the cues from Ayurveda. That's the only difference. It is an emerging discipline which harnesses the tools and methods of molecular biology to investigate the concepts, procedures, and therapeutic effects of Ayurveda. Now, there are many obstacles in this. It's not easy to do this. First of all, identifying concepts, procedures, and mechanistic studies which would lend themselves to experimental work. Because the moment you talk about research using molecular biology and immunology, you are talking about a laboratory. 
Now you have to have the problem amenable to be tackled in the experimental laboratory. Like for example, Pajapura Siddhanta, that is the microcosm, the universe, microcosm, the human body. There is a homology, it is a fundamental doctrine in Ayurveda. Very important, at every stage it will come. But how do you make it into a concept? You can investigate in the lab. This problem, that is the first problem which you will face. Second, designing experiments and protocols on the basis of descriptions. Because a description of a, a, a treatment, for example, may be only in uh, two verses written 2000 years ago. They cannot write great detailed met materials and methods, several pages, which you need for a protocol. So from this very brief description, some of the terms are amenable to controversy. The measures that they have used, people don't agree on that. There are all these problems when you are dealing with an ancient text. But using that, can you make a protocol, which not only you can do, but somebody else can follow the same protocol and re replicate the same results. Now that is the second problem. Third, creating partnerships between scientists and Vaidyas. This is exceedingly difficult because they, too, they talk two different languages. There is no eagerness to meet each other. In fact, there is no forum until perhaps now like you are doing here. There, there was no forum where Vaidyas and scientists, they had a common forum where they meet and discuss anything. That didn't exist. So there is a real problem creating partnerships. Here if you want to do this kind of research, for several years you have to work together, trying to understand each other. Now that is a big problem. And skepticism, prejudice is very strong in India. That has to be overcome. And obtaining financial support for this, because these are expensive. How do you get the money? So these are all the problems which we face. It took us some time to do this and they were finally overcome and we could, I wrote this in 2006 towards Ayurvedic biology. This was Indian Academy of Sciences in Bangalore. At 2005, I was, their annual meeting, I gave a talk in uh, Benares and the president at that time was Dr. Ramakrishnan, a very eminent physicist. So he asked me, can you please write this? We will publish it as a vision document. That is how it was published in 2006. I was not sure whether we would be able to do it, so I was cautious in saying towards Ayurvedic biology. Now, the initially it received the support of uh, Dr. Chidambaram. It is interesting that uh, even though this document came out, it was seen by health department, DBT, DST, everybody saw, but nobody was willing to support. Everybody will say it is an excellent idea. But the person who really understood and gave the support was a neutron physicist, <coughs> Dr. Chidambaram. I have incidentally seen this again and again. If you want to see really open mind in science, willing to look at even philosophy, you will find a physicist doing this. When I was developing a heart valve, for example, in Trivandrum, it is not easy to develop a heart valve because it has beat 100,000 times a day, 36 million times a year and the international standards say it should function without mechanical failure for 10 years. You have to demonstrate 360 million times without a mechanical failure in a wear tester. It is not easy to do it. At that time, physicians condemned the whole thing. They said this is nonsense, ridiculous. Americans can do it. British are not doing it. How can you develop this here? Nobody supported, no biologist supported. The only people who came forward, physicists, was a Ram Session, for example. I can remember a few people. Why not? Engineers. These were the two pillars. Here again, here is something totally unconventional. And it was Dr. Chidambaram who supported this. And thanks to that, we had, these were the initial uh, projects which uh, one is the genomic variation analysis of human dosha prakriti, which is very fundamental, vata, pitta, kapha. Is there a genomic basis for this? Studies on the biological effects of Ayurvedic formulations, that is, we chose uh, amalagi rasayana on drosophila. 
and studies on the effects of amylokira sina on the genomic stability of neurons and astrocytes in the brain. Uh, that was done by Dr. Kalluri Subarao in Hyderabad. And physical chemical properties of uh, Ayurvedic metal based drug, Rasa Sindur. This was done by BARC in Bombay and Ayurveda Shala Kotekal. And the immunological metabolic effects of Panchakarma at the GS Medical College and KEM Hospital, uh, Mumbai, RF Podar Hospital, and uh, ATREC. Uh, atomic energy. So, these were the projects that uh, we started, a few projects supported by PSA's office. I will just, uh, I am not going into details of all this, I will just give the results of this, so that you have a flavor of what is the type of research that Ayurvedic biology does. That is all my purpose here, I am not an expert in these areas, but I will go quickly through this. For example, this uh, task force in Ayurvedic biology, after the only three years Chidambaram's PSA's office could give the support. Then they stopped. So, we had done enough work by that time. Published papers had come. Number of good institutions were collaborating. Vaidyas and scientists co cooperating to do the work. So, the DST was sufficiently encouraged. They took it over under the Science and Engineering Research Board. So, they set up a task force in Ayurvedic Biology. This is the successor to the earlier program. Here too, I am only presenting those where papers have been published. This is on can amylokira rasayana attenuate cardiac dysfunction associated with cardiac failure and aging. This was done by Rajiv Gandhi Institute in uh, Trivandrum, evaluating the potential of Ayurvedic amylokira rasayana and rasasindol in suppressing Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. This is done in CCMB, Hyderabad. So, these are the projects where papers have been published. I will just go through this dosha prakriti, the first one. Now, vada, pitta, kapha, prakritis, this is a fundamental concept. It is set at the time of conception itself. It does not change. And that determines the predisposition to diseases. It determines the individ individual response to treatment. So, without knowing that, a physician cannot treat patients. But the question is, in the old days, it was determined on the basis of physical, mental and behavioral traits. Based on that, they would say this is Vada Pitta. But is there a biological evidence for this? That is the question today, which could not be done 40 years ago. But today we can do it. So, this is in those days, it was intuitively a physician would determine. It is still being done like that. We wanted to make it a little more rigorous. So, the IU Soft program developed in this city. We used IU Soft also. Those intuitively determined, those same subjects would be seen by a IUSOFT expert who would use a computer assisted determination and we took only when there was agreement and surprisingly we had no idea whether there would be any agreement at all, but we have found that there is an 80 percent agreement. So, only those subjects were taken for this study, so made it a little more rigorous and 300 subjects in UDP, 300 in Pune and 300 in Bangalore with the cooperation from and Kalpana Joshi is sitting here, she was part of this in Pune. So, the subjects were taken and blood samples were taken from where there was agreement. And we chose uh, only two markers, a uh, number of markers we have to choose. Uh, so, our molecular biology colleagues, they decided two single nucleotide polymorphism SNPs, which is very widely used. Another is epigenetic alterations that are responsible for phenotypic differences. Epigenetics is almost nature scientific reports. The principal uh, work was done in. Uh, CCMB Hyderabad, they, they did this work on based on SNPs and they found that uh, you can read this very well, 262 well classified individuals out of this total of 3,400 3, or so and uh, 52 SNPs were different between these Prakritis without any co compound egg factors because caste does it come into this language. So, many other things can vitiate your sample. So, excluding all those they came to this. 262 well classified people and the SNPs uh, they found 52 which were 
specific to these and the use in these SNPs, 62, they were classified into groups of Vata, Pitta and Kapha. And they also found there is a gene, PGMI1 gene, which we can see here correlated with, with Pitta phenotype. That is very important because this gene is at the center of many metabolic pathways which all have to deal with metabolism like gly glycolysis, galactose metabolism and so on. And Pitta essentially is also involved in these same metabolic activities. So there is a, we cannot get, say that this is equals to that, but there is a very strong association. Now this was a paper and subsequently others also have come. Now this was the DNA methylation for the epigenetic changes. This was done by Satyamurthy's group. Same blood samples were used. He was doing the uh, samples were subjected to methylated DNA immune precipitation test. And uh, there you can see the differential DNA methylation signatures in three distinct Prakriti phenotypes. They demonstrate the epigenetic basis of Vata, Pitta and Kapha. So this was also published in a top journal. Here is no biological evidence for these dosha prakritis. Then we move to the other project, microstructure or Sindura, because it has always been a puzzle. Mercury, as you know, is banned. It cannot be used even for dental amalgam anymore. It is very dangerous, highly toxic. And uh, in my student days, I can remember there was no diuretic at that time, oral diuretic only injectable mercurial diuretics. Everybody was scared. You have to admit the patient when you give mercurial diuretics. Somebody coming with cardiac failure, swelling in the legs, you have to give diuretic. And because the renal toxicity was a very great danger. So it has been banned. But here, if you talk to senior Ayurvedic physicians, including the revered PK warrior or cortical, I have asked him myself. And they tell you, we don't use it often. But I have used it many times. I have not seen this problem. So you talk to Siddha physicians in Tamil Nadu. They will tell you the same thing. So there is a puzzle here. Instead of dismissing this as nonsense, that is not science. You have to test it. Now how to any kind of chemical testing mercury is there. So the objection applies. Then the question comes, can you look at the structure, microstructure? Now that is what this study which uh, Atomic Energy BRC did that using X-ray absorption fine structure. They have all the equipment here, perhaps the only place which has that equipment. And this analysis, the, uh, the Rasa Sindhu was made in cortical exactly as per the original protocol. And uh, it is a single phase alpha mercury sulfide in their analysis, unstable metallic mercury or beta mercury sulfide, they are not there. It is only pure alpha crystalline form. And Rasa Sindura is found to be comprised of nanoparticles of uh, 24 nanometers, having hardly any free mercury or organic molecules. Rasa Sindura has a robust structure, negligible porosity. These are all taken from their paper. The non-existence of uh, free mercury and the absence of uh, unstable forms robust character would ensure the integrity because there is very little porosity, it is very stable. It will ensure the integrity of the drug during delivery and the prevention of its reduction to free mercury. And this places, this is a quote from their paper, this places Ayurvedic synthesis method at par with contemporary techniques of nanoparticle synthesis. And uh, this is of course uh, not given to patients, they have only done the structural study. But that is, this was published in Journal of Synchrotron Radiation, one of their top journals. And after this was published, that uh, uh, Devadatta Lahiri, who was the chief scientist, she was invited to the big pharma congress in the United States within three or four weeks to present a paper there. Because they are interested in the toxicity of uh, nano drugs and the delivery. Now, here they found something in a nano form has been used for thousands of years. So there must be something they wanted to learn about the non-toxicity of this. So it is an important paper. Then immunologic and metabolic responses to Basti in obesity. This was done in uh, Podar Hospital. 
and all the immunologic studies were done by Chiplunker's group in uh, at REC. 32 obese individuals, they underwent this uh, Basti treatment. There was a significant reduction in weight, BMI, which was not our primary interest, but all those they have given. But the most important finding, the significant decrease in the production of interferon gamma, interleukin-6, these are the two very important. There is something else, an experimental, I won't go into that. A significant correlation, there is a tandem relationship between IL-6 and IL-8 at S2. S2 is uh, after the treatment has started, S3 is 90 days later. And positive correlation between IgG and IL-6 and Basti modulates, the conclusion is this, it modulates the immune response by insulin resistance causing pro-inflammatory cytokines. And insulin resistance, as you know, the obesity, that fat is not just a passive lump of fat sitting there. It is actually highly active, chemically very active. It is producing a whole lot of things. Now, these insulin resistance causing, these cytokines are all decreased cut down by this enema, pasti. It starts from the start of treatment, S2 is after the treatment has started. And the effect continues to remain even three months after the treatment is over. That is the work which they had done. Now we come to Amalaki Rasayana, which was another project we took. And uh, Rasayana is a general Rasayana, the whole body, as I indicated earlier. And uh, this was done by, in fact, when the Rasayana project was being discussed. Cortical, our colleagues, they had wanted Narasimha Rasayana used. But Professor R. H. Singh, who is a member of our task force, uh, he said, you know, why don't you use Apalaki Rasayana? It was his suggestion. So we accepted that. All this work, now there is a considerable amount of work on Apalaki Rasayana, which is very interesting. Now that was given, the, one of the first experiments done was Professor Kalluri Subrao in uh, Hyderabad. He had been working for many years on DNA chain breaks in the brain, single chain, double chain breaks. He was interested in that, its progression, its rate of repair, the way of detection, etc. So I asked him at that time, can you try this, our Amalaki Rasayana in the He said, oh, there is no problem. That work which was done, it showed the DNA damage indicated by breaks in single and double chain. It, he would measure at 3, 9 and 15 months in all his experiments. That's what, that was done here also. And single and double strand breaks were significantly less in Amalaki Rasayana fed rat's brain compared to controls. This is all published in a very good journal. And both neurons and astrocytes in the Rasayana fed rats show greater genomic stability. Beneficial effect of Amalaki Rasayana on maintaining genomic stability in brain cells demonstrated clearly. This was the first paper which came. Now this was seen by Dr. Kaldi, Dr. Lakotia, who is a very eminent Drosophila geneticist in uh, Banaras, he asked me at that time, see, this is a very good way science grows. Somebody has done work, it is published, you get a cue from that. That's where it goes. So it is a very, one of the important ways science grows. So Lakotia said, can, do you think I can try it in my flies? I said, there is no harm. After all, even flies, we share so many genes. There is no reason why it should not work. Why don't you try? So he tried. He was very skeptical. Initially, for example, the Amalaki Rasayana, the final stage, they use ghee and honey. So he said, maybe that is working. How do you know? So he tried a set of experiments initially, giving only honey and ghee. Actually, that was bad for the flies. <laughs> so it took six months to prove this to his satisfaction. But anyway, time was not important for us. So that work was done. And this was published in PLOS One. This is, of course, this I have already finished, Subrahos. This is uh, Drosophila. We have moved to the next. Now, he found a series of findings in that. The larvae fed on the Amalaki Rasayana showed earlier pupation and earlier adult eclosion. They grow faster. The salivary gland size greatly enlarged, enhanced levels of heterogeneous nuclear ribonucleoproteins in the DNA, significant increase in the total and hashed eggs in the female flies, their fecundity improves, medium lifespan is increased significantly. These are all findings in the Amalagi supplemented diet. 
in the flies. The thermal stress, Lakotia has done a lot of work on heat shock protein, so he is an expert in this. Thermal stress tolerated much better. Starvation is tolerated much better. These are all the findings from that paper which was published in PLOS 1. It was not easy to publish. Three times they sent it back. I was telling Dr. Tillu yesterday, first time a referee wrote back, we had given the, the how the amyloid kerosene is made. That is cortical, the procedure which they follow. And we had given a reference of Ashtangradev on amyloid kerosene. So the referee wrote back, that also shows the thoroughness with which they do this. A referee's letter, one of the referees, he wrote, this particular reference doesn't give all these things which you are mentioning. What we had described under materials and methods, that is not mentioned here. How do you explain this? Now the problem for us, Lakotia was very upset because his molecular part, there was no question. It was all accepted. Here is something they are asking about Ayurvedic reference. So when we asked Kotakal, they are very methodical people. They said, you know, doctor, are you reasonable? See, here to make it, you pick 20 amlaki. At the right season, you pick it, you dry it, you powder it. You mix it with an equal amount of uh, fresh juice of amlaki. You dry it, you repeat it 20 times. All these are there. You expect a book written 1600 years ago to give all these details and survive even today. And there are thousands of formulations. Is it conceivable? Are you reasonable? Now, I d it is not reasonable, but my problem is how to convince that referee. Otherwise, he won't accept. I mean, he's right also. So, finally, we have to find our own, invent our own way of overcoming this, being truthful at the same time. So, we resolved it by saying, materials and methods, we will only write what Kotekel has done, exactly. They can come and verify, their log books are there, no problem. But don't give any reference there. In the discussion, when you write, this formulation was made based on an ancient description. You give the reference there. Nothing. This was accepted. The referee was satisfied. <laughs> so we have to do, be inventive, even in the publication of papers, because this is a new area. Now the Lakotia was sufficiently confident when this paper was published. In fact, it came within the PLOS one they wrote saying that the, that particular year, the top 100 cited papers, this was one of them. So he was very happy. And he is also an expert on genetic engineering of Drosophila. Human diseases can be induced in the Drosophila. And that several, one is the Huntington's chorea, is a neurodegenerative, brain degenerative disorder. Another is uh, Alzheimer's. So he had flies with these models of human disease. He gave it to them and there he found it suppressed the neurodegeneration during the larval period without side effects, prevented the accumulation of inclusion bodies and heat, heat shock proteins, suppressed apoptosis, elevated the levels of heterogeneous nuclear ribonucleic proteins and improved the ubiquitin proteosomal system, as a scavenging system that is improved. So this paper is also published which has received, this has induced another scientist to do similar work. I will come to that. Now, this is the uh, scientist working in CC in the Hyderabad. He had seen this work of Lakotia in flies. He had a mouse model, Dr. Patil, mouse model of Alzheimer's, chemically induced Alzheimer's, not genetically altered. Now, he wanted to try this in his that is only in flies, this is in mice. It is very different in the significance. And there he found the effect of amyloid resina in ameliorating the memory and neurometabolism in the mouse model of Alzheimer's, chemically induced, compared with donapizil, which is a standard drug used, not very great, but that is the medicine which the FDA has approved in treating Alzheimer's. This is not a comparative trial. They were only trying to see, we know the mechanism of donapizil working is the mechanism of working of this Amalaki Rasana in any way similar to that. This is all they are trying to do. The question is that, not a comparative trial. And the AR treatment should show improvement in memory. The MACE test was done. This paper is published. You can read it. 
and it showed increased 13C labeling of amino acids suggesting significant enhancement of glutaminergic and uh, GABAergic metabolic activity in the mouse model. The above changes are similar to those produced by Donepecil. So that current chemotherapy which is being used, the mechanism of action is very similar to what you see with this. This is a outgrowth of Lakotia's work. You can see how it goes. The traditional Indian, this is the most recent. Uh, Dr. Karta is a, an old colleague of mine. He works in Rajiv Gandhi. And uh, he has been working for several years on cardiac hypertrophy. So if you have an obstruction, for example, aortic valve, there is an obstruction. Or aorta itself, there is a coarctation, a narrowing. Then the left ventricle has to pump much, much harder against this resistance. So it will keep on thickening. The muscle becomes thicker and thicker. Until at last, a time comes because when it becomes very thick, it cannot relax. Because heart, there is a systole, a contraction, diastole, a relaxation. So when the muscle becomes very thick, it cannot relax. And failure of relaxation leads to failure. That, that is true for all of us. If we don't know how to relax, then surely we are going to fail. So here, that cardiac failure induced by hypertrophy <coughs> and cardiac failure induced by aging process, degenerative change. In these, can this Rasayana do anything? That was the experiment which he did. And uh, that AR intake improved the cardiac function, decreased LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, increased fatigue time in treadmill test in aging. It's amazing the kind of instrumentation we have today. In these ra rats, you can do treadmill test. Everything is measured. The size, the thickness of the left ventricle, the echocardiography, you can measure. I am amazed at the kind of instrumentation we have today, accurate measurements. And they are intake produce beneficial effect on myocardial energetics, muscle contractile function and exercise tolerance. This is what I mentioned earlier. The first part we had actually shown, but the, they would not accept. So it took almost two years to do all these molecular level tests, but finally got accepted. Now the current status of this Ayurvedic biology it has been taken over as the task force in the Department of Science and Technology. It's funded by the Science and Engineering Research Board. It is appearing on their website. It supports research in modern science based on cues from Ayurveda. Funded projects from institutions all over India. Universities beginning to show interest in organizing courses at master's level in Ayurvedic biology. I think you are also showing interest here in Bangalore and some, somebody else. So there is a growing awareness of this new area. Young students wanting to work in this area. So that is encouraging. Now the scientific prospects here, really based on ideas. Where do we get the ideas for this? One of them is the study of classical texts. Now this requires joint effort by Ayurvedic physicians, Ayurvedic scholars. A physician need not be a scholar. We need the Ayurvedic physician who is also a scholar. Uh, so we need interaction between a person like that and a scientist. It cannot be done in just a meeting uh, if you are interested in uh, any Ayurvedic problem. It may be Rasayana, it may be Rudhujariya, it could be anything. If you are interested in that, repeated discussions, reading. Over a period of it should be a small group, a study group maybe four or five people, not a very large number. They share that interest. It may be in Rasayana, anything else. But they should be meeting, reading, and slowly some idea will come, like this. After all, whoever thought we can show this effect, cardiac failure. At the very basic level, we can show changes. This has taken four years for the experimental work. A lot of discussion. I have to convince them, Karta and his colleagues, why would they want to use their laboratory facilities for a study like this? And they can do their own conventional work on cooperation. But that requires patient's discussion. For example, chronobiology, your subject of your symposium here. In chronobiology, suppose you want to do some work. How do you do it in the laboratory? If you want to do that, for example, Ayurveda says the Two months, two months, that is how it is decided, a year. But for convenience, they divide it into two halves. 
Adana and Visarga. Adana, all the moisture is taken away from the body, human body, from plants, from animals. We all become dehydrated, tired. That is one. The whole earth is dried up. But then the next half, all the moisture comes back. So everything is changed. This cycle goes on. But during these two halves, the important thing is, apart from all this tiredness and all that, the greenery is going, the chemistry changes, the rasa changes. The three rasas are dominating in Adana. The three others are dominating in Visarga. Now, rasa, remember, is the ancient term for chemistry. I already mentioned that. So what they are saying, Ayurveda, the body chemistry, body fluids, chemistry is changing. This is what it says. Now, here is something very interesting. If you look at chemistry today, we will look at electrolytes. We have various things. We do all that and you cannot find any change because science today says there is internal constant environment. That's a fundamental principle. A dead body has no constant, it is equilibrates in the environment. But a living body, our internal chemistry is entirely different from external. Temperature is different pH is different. That difference is life. This is Claude Bernard's very great physiologist, French physiologist. So we will not find electrolytes, you will not find. So you may say, oh, this is all nonsense. But if you have to do research in this, this is only in the last 48 hours since your chronobiology, I'm thinking. Now there it is possible, there may be something beyond chemistry, these electrolytes. When we were students, I give an example. The digestion in the stomach or gut is all based on enzymes. Saliva has enzymes. Gastric juice has enzymes. Intestinal juice has enzymes. Pancreas enzymes. So these enzymes were digestion. That was for us. That was it. We had to know all that. Food is digested. They are absorbed, assimilated. That's it. We never realized Many things we could not fully explain because there are people who are pure vegetarians. They are in perfectly good health. Where is their protein? You calculate all that. But they are, they are quite healthy. Many things like this. But today, as soon as microbiome was known, now we realize we cannot say digestion is all because of enzymes. There is a whole new change in this, the way we look at it. So similarly, when you say these two halves, there is a difference. It is not difference in the electrolytes. Could be something else. Now, can we look for that? Now, here is a fundamental issue. It requires a lot of patience, a lot of discussion, a lot of work. But that sort of thing can be done in the lab. Now, this is really the study of classics. That is one way new ideas will come. Because these classics have survived for at least 2,000 years. Charaga redacted it in first century. He says at the end of every chapter, Agni Vesha Tantra Puna Samskrite, I am redacting Agni Vesha Tantra, which existed for thousands, hundreds of years earlier. So it's that old. So it has survived all these years. So we should look at it again and again. And these ideas are actually, according to me, children of God. Ideas. We cannot create anything. But you have to keep on trying. It's not easy to get children of God. You have to approach with respect, with humility. And when you get that idea, you have to nurture it. You cannot quickly do an experiment and say, oh, there is nothing in it. That's not the way to treat a child. Even if the child makes a mistake, you keep on trying again. That way you will get somewhere. The second is, uh, clinical experience of very senior physicians. Nowadays, all these half-baked, undocumented, many people, even our task force, we get reports like this. This is effective in something. Don't accept such things. We can accept, as far as I am concerned, aptas in Ayurveda, the source of knowledge, as you know. One is pratyaksha, what you see, what you observe. Another is anumana, inference. If there is smoke, there must be fire, that kind of inference. And the third Ayurveda also accepts apta, that is the word of apta. Apta is a very exceptional type of person. 
is a saint, I mean, he's an expert in theory, in practice, incapable of telling lies, who can see the present, past, and future. Extraordinary individual. Such a person tells you something, you accept it. It is as good as paper published in nature. For me, if, say, PK Warrior, 90 years in Kotekal, he tells me, in this disease, if you give this, I think this can create this problem. For me, it is as good as reading a top journal, because that is source of knowledge, valid knowledge. If he says, don't do this, you better listen to him. Otherwise, you are going to learn yourself by causing harm to a patient. So that also is important, a source of knowledge. So a study of classical text, the other is clinical experience. Either it should be from aptas like this, I will accept it. I am willing to do research on that. Or it should be documented. Give me a report. You have treated 20 patients. These are the patients. This is what I did. This is the result. Show me that. This is never given. Don't accept that. Any project coming to us with undog, we just throw it out. We don't accept it. But this clinical experience, which is acceptable, that is another source of ideas. Cues from published work, which is what is happening here. Subarau did some work, so Lakotia does it, Lakotia does, somebody else does it, so that grows. That is what is happening. Now, a university has begun an MSc course in Ayurvedic biology, that is the institutional prospects with a holistic approach, this is in Bangalore, and centers of excellence in Ayurvedic biology. I, I see two or three universities are showing interest, setting it up regular. Uh, Ayurvedic biology centers, because one of the problems is people who have done this outstanding work, publishing in nature and so on, when they finish their PhD, they have no jobs. So three of them, they have gone to pharmaceutical companies doing work which has nothing to do with what they did earlier. One has become a teacher, so we are losing all these people. We cannot build this discipline. So there is an interest on the part of universities to set up centers of uh, excellence. Investigators. There should be scientists with serious interest in investigating this, not just because a transaction only. There is a grant coming, you do the work and then forget it. That won't work. These are scientists with commitment. Similarly, Ayurvedic physicians who are open to this. Without this, there can be no progress. And the support for PhD programs, Ayush has, as you know, established that. That is not enough. Our science departments, DBT, ICMR, DST, etc., should, they should offer PhD fellowships with contingencies for universities, postdoc career development awards, because after PhD, they are again stuck. As I mentioned, they have no job. So for five years, there should be a career development award where they can go, they get their grant, they get uh, contingency grants, they can go to a university or an institute and work there for five years, during which they get their own grants, and by the end of that, there is no guarantee they will get a job there, but they will be wanted by institutions to start up their own. These are, we are trying for this. And uh, institutes and universities should be willing to offer opportunities for doctoral and postdoc work. If somebody comes like that with a grant, universities and institutes uh, should create facilities, make it uh, good for them to work there. It is a national investment that we are making. That is the current status of this discipline. I will stop. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful Thank talk. You. I now request the Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Nitin Karmarkar, to kindly address the gathering. Good afternoon. I first of all have to thank Professor Gadri. This has been perhaps the sixth lecture that I am attending, and every time he keeps reminding me that you have to come and attend these lectures or senior persons coming and they speaking. Although I am a geology person, but I am getting to understand various different aspects of science. And today's lecture was uh, one of such kind basically. And in fact, over here I must mention that person throughout uh, practice basically allopathic medicine, being a surgeon and cardiac specialist, later on getting into Ayurveda and writing books on Ayurvedic biology, which to an extent basically been actually in the recent time at the Department of Health Sciences, perhaps 
but Vardhan sir is taking up something of this kind. So I'm pretty sure that uh, the thoughts that you expressed and the kind of basically uh, the evolutionary trend that you have kept before the student would uh, inculcate interest among this particular branch. And I'm pretty sure that when we are looking for institution of eminence writing proposal for such, we should not miss out on these dif various different aspects. Uh, we'll, I certainly promise you that the kind of thing that you're expecting from the university, I promise you that in the come next five years, we would uh, work hard on, on, on doing such thing. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir. I would now like to request Dr. Palip to kindly felicitate Dr. Veliathan. Okay, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, Professor Veliathan for uh, his valuable time since yesterday and for giving a very nice uh, talk on Ayurvedic biology. I think this is a term that he has coined himself and it has been propagated and has very nicely shown how we can use modern medicine and Ayurvedic, uh, Ayurvedic science. He also mentioned about uh, I being an inorganic chemist, the mercury uh, that he mentioned was very fascinating and nanoparticles of mercury uh, have been used and now the word term nanoparticles is becoming very famous and people had used it for uh, for a long time i thank you once again sir for coming to our university to give this talk and i would also like to mention that he was also he's visited our university several times before and in i think in 2004 he was the chief guest at one of the convocations uh, functions i also would like to thank professor gadre Professor Bhushan Patwardhan, Dr. Girish Tillu, and the staff at uh, Health Science Department for organizing this uh, Science Club uh, Colloquium today. Grey Eye Vision and the staff from doc doctor, uh, Mr. Khare, Sarang Potnis, Deepak Hardikar, Mr. Kharade from Chemistry Department. My colleagues who are helping me organize this, Sub Dr. Subhash Kendre, Dr. Gram Puroj sir, Tuli Day, if she's around. Uh, thank you for this. We'll please look forward to further such colloquiums in the next semester. And I thank one, one and all. I would also like to take this opportunity to give away the prizes for the last two colloquia which were held in August and October. And I would request Professor Valyathan to do the honors, please. This was for the, the first one was for the mathematics uh, colloquium that was held in the Department of Chemistry in August. And uh, so the, the prize goes to Miss Ashwini Rane from Department of Environmental Sciences. In the second colloquia in the physics department, uh, we had about 50 people who su submitted their summary. And uh, Ms. Shazia Khan, I don't know if she's around. And the, the second prize in the same colloquia also goes to Ms. Ashwini Rane. Uh, thank you, thank you very much and uh, we will close this session uh, now. The interactive session with Professor Valiathan will be held in the afternoon after lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>